What I'd like to focus our attention on as far as the scripture reading is concerned is here in verse 22. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Today, there are many shows on TV that uh, is these, uh, these shows where they go and rehab a house. And possibly they'll do it for a particular couple. And so they get a whole team of people, electricians, plumbers, sheet rockers, and, and interior designers and so on. And they go in and they spend a week or two, whatever it is, and they gut the place and they blow out walls and change this and change that. And then there's finally the day of the reveal, right? And so... Uh, in fact, sometimes, depending on the show, I guess that the people are a part of that process until they say, okay, y'all got to get out of here, and they go away for a few days, put them up in a hotel, I guess, and then they can come back for this final reveal to see what it's really going to be. Well, there are quite a few times that God has done the same. In a, in a sense, it is absolutely blatant right there in the open, but you don't see it for what God intends down the road, you might say. But first of all, we know that there are some absolutely hidden things of God. If you'll turn over to Acts chapter 1, we'll notice over in verses 6 and 7. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Therefore... When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Here's Jesus' response. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now we know that Jesus already said that he nor the angels know uh, when Christ is going to come back to gather his people. So, it's very plausible that Jesus didn't really even have the answer. But he's obviously pointing out that it's not for them to know. Notice over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who is in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven Things which angels desired to look into. Much uh, revelation is shared with us, you might say, uh, some insights in this passage. We first notice that the prophets who prophesied the coming of the Messiah and his death, his resurrection, and so on, we would certainly see in Psalm 22 that you know, Christ's thoughts upon the cross is my conclusion in that context that here they are revealing mysteries, but they didn't know how it was going to actually transpire, how it was all going to come about, how it was going to come to fruition. And so we also see that it really wasn't for them to even know. It was for us. It's for us in that we can look back and we can read about the prophecies made by the prophets themselves in regard to Christ that they came about. When Christ stands up and, and he reads, and he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, many, many passages that we can actually turn to to see that what was spoken of prior by the prophets, they really didn't understand what's being said, even though they're saying it. And that it was really for our benefit that they said it, not for the people then, because they died before Christ even came and gave his life upon the cross as far as that specific act is concerned. And so we see there in verse 12, to them 
it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering. They were doing us a favor to really share what was going to transpire. It had nothing to do with them, but it certainly, and I say nothing to do with them in the sense that uh, they weren't going to be able to take advantage of it at the time. Uh, but we certainly can, and it also bolsters our faith because we can look back and see those prophecies stated, the fulfillment of them, and today we are, of course, benefited. So the angels tried to look into it, but they did, did not see the full um, intention of God. Over in Romans chapter 16, Verses 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began. This is another passage that we can turn to to point out that God's plan was before time began. And so he's saying that these were mysteries kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures has been known to all nations. It was a mystery before then. Didn't know how it was going to transpire, how it was going to come to fruition again according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So we who are on the back side of the prophecies and the fulfillment of those prophecies through Jesus Christ should stand in awe at the wisdom of God and how he has brought those things that were hidden, that were in secret, to light. So, having mentioned that, of course, there's types and antitypes. The type is the shadow. The type that comes before the antitype. Noah and the flood and baptism are one of those types and antitypes. So, Baptism is, a ref is the real thing you might say, but in that sense was the fulfillment of what the shadow was in the destruction of the whole world by water. So over in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, my conclusion is through Noah, the preaching of Noah, to turn the world from sin to God, but they didn't listen, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited and waited. <laughs> Uh, the preaching of Noah was for 100, 120 years, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is, and here's our key word, an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not taking a bath. But the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we see that by the water, the earth was cleansed. The, all that was left was Noah and his family in the ark. Uh, many, many types and antitypes in regard to the church and so on that we can pull from uh, Noah and the flood. But the idea is that we can look back at the flood and see how that applies to us. In a sense, uh, very similar, and in other ways, you know, completely different, in the sense that, that we're not Noah, we're under a different covenant, uh, many different things, but the likeness is that water cleansed the world of all evil. Noah and his family are saved. And so our souls, our individual souls are saved through water, there's nothing special about the water in that sense, whether it's uh, an ocean water, water from a river, from a pond, from a stream, from uh, a tap. The point is, is that we are obedient, just as Noah was obedient to God. Faith was involved, and we're going to conclude that there was 
most likely no rain. How are you going to flood the earth and so on? And so many things. So though they were hidden back then, but now that mystery, in a sense, being revealed, we look back and we see the similarities between these two things, Noah and the flood and baptism and how our souls are washed by the blood of the Lamb. In regard to Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, we're talking about Adam and Jesus. We're going to pull this one verse to really summarize this, this whole chapter. But nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of of him who was to come. When we would see in this context that Adam brought sin into the world, Jesus came to take sin out of the world. So the likeness is that these two individuals are active. They, they've done something quite significant. Adam, thanks Adam, <laughs> you know, counted it as the, the first sinner, if you will. Eve is deceived. Adam absolutely sinned. And in this context, it's accounted to him for the whole sin of the world, if you will, for bringing sin into the world, and Jesus trying to carry sin out through his sacrifice, of course. So the type is Adam, the anti-type is Jesus. The third example that I'd like for us to consider, this, this idea of kind of a mystery, that it, that it seems to stand on its own, but there's a connection to us now to things that happened so long ago. Jonah and Jesus. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, we had a discussion recently, was he dead or was he alive? Either way, there's a miracle. Whether he was alive while he was in the belly of the fish or whether he died, was swallowed by the fish, and then was resurrected, if you will, after being vomited back on the ground, on the land, but far as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now when you're reading about Jonah, you wouldn't think about the Messiah at all. But Jonah stands as a type to Jesus being an anti-type. So Jesus kind of opens up our eyes and, and he reveals something that happened hundreds of years before but it's still relevant to him, and it's relevant to us. So, I say all of that to come to this somewhat of a conclusion. Please turn over to Leviticus chapter 16. We are not going to re read Leviticus chapter 16, uh, because I probably put y'all all to sleep and you might miss lunch. <laughs> But uh, I will hit some of the highlights of this chapter. So we're going to kind of go through it quickly. We would notice over in verse 2 that this Day of Atonement is once a year. In verse 3, he would take the blood of a young bull uh, as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. In verse 4, he's going to wash his body, that is, the, the priest's, um, very specifically, it's going to be Aaron, the high priest, and then he's going to put on these holy garments. In verse 5, two kid goats is a sin offering, one ram is a burnt offering. In verses 8 through 10, we have one of the two goats becomes the scapegoat. Remember, they would go and lay their hands on that goat and send him out into the wilderness. He would live. In, in verse 12, the high priest is going to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar and sweet incense. Now this is important about this sweet incense here in just a moment because we see in verse 13. Put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony. Verse 14. Take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger, the high priest, on the mercy seat seven times. In verse 15, kill the goat of the sin offering and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. So not only is the bull of the blood, the bull of the blood, the blood of the bull, but also the blood from this goat. 
is going to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. In fact, in verse 30 we read, the priest was to make atonement for the people before the Lord. And in verse 34, this was done to make atonement for the children of Israel once every year, as we noted in verse 2. So, Jesus, I'm going to kind of shift gears here and say Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus is our propitiation. The word that is translated propitiation, this Greek word is only found two times in the New Testament. Romans chapter 3, and it's actually going to be down in verse 25. But we're going to start in verse 23. So Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. Whom God set forth, that is Jesus Christ, as a propitiation by His blood. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because, <clears throat> because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it states specifically using, now if you look up the word propitiation, you'll find it more than just two times, uh, depending on which translation you are looking at. But this Greek word that I'm referring to is only found two times in the New Testament, of course, being Greek, of course. It's not going to be found in the Old Testament at all in that sense. The other passage is Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5. But let's start reading in verse 3. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3. We're right in the middle of a sentence. There's a description given to us in regard to the old law and, and the things of the tabernacle and so on. And so we begin, and behind the second veil. Now, there was the, the holies. There was the court, the holies, and then the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is what we read about a while ago in regard to... Leviticus chapter 16 that the high priest went into only once a year only he and so behind the second veil the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all or the holy of holies which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold and which were the golden pot that had the manna Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets, that's the third thing found as far as contents in the Ark of the Covenant. And the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of which things we cannot now speak in detail. Now I told you that propitiation is found in two places. This particular Greek word is found in two places in all of the New Testament. Did you read? Did you hear it? there? Do you see it in the context of Hebrews chapter 9? We don't see it. We don't see it translated propitiation. What we do see is that it's translated mercy seat. Well, the reason is is that is part of the definition. Uh, this particular Greek word that's found only these two times in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 and here in Romans, I mean, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5 is halasterion. Halasterion is defined by Strong's as an expiator, uh, a place or thing, in other words, concretely, an atoning victim, or especially the lid of the ark in the temple. As referring to the Ark of the Covenant, of course, that we just got to reading about. Mercy seat propitiation. Jesus is our propitiation. So we mentioned earlier about this kind of this reveal, and we see that 
that there's a, there's a connection between Adam and Jesus. There's a connection between Noah and the flood and our salvation through baptism and faith in Jesus Christ. Accessing that grace, if you will. Having our sins washed away like the earth was washed by the water of the flood. So, Jesus is... Our mercy seat. We've already mentioned that he is our propitiation. He is our mercy seat. The Hebrew name for this was kaporeth. And it's from the verb kafer. And that is to cover or to conceal. You see, the mercy seat is what you can see. In the slide, it was this right here. So let me share with you just a few connections between this mercy seat, which sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant that had the two cherubim on it. In, in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22, it was from this place that God was represented as speaking to the children of Israel. And so we would read over in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22, And I will speak to thee from above the Elisterion. I will speak to you from above the mercy seat. That's where God was going to speak to Aaron. In Leviticus chapter 16, in verse 2, God says, For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. This seat, or cover, was covered with the smoke of the incense. Remember, we read about that, and I said, you know, this is significant. Remember this? So he would walk in with the incense that he'd pull, he'd pull the, the coals of fire off of the altar. Then he put incense on the coals that are in this censer, in this container, if you will, bronze container, and would walk in to the Holy of Holies. Then that smoke, this, the smoke from this incense would cover the mercy seat when the high priest would enter. And so it's over, over the mercy seat, and that's where God would be. It is where he would speak. In Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 13, and the blood of the bullet offered on the great day of atonement was to be sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And before the mercy seat seven times. That idea of completeness. So what we have is Jesus going into the Holy of Holies in the true Holy of Holies in heaven according to Hebrews chapter 9 and offering himself not the high priest taking the blood of the goat or the blood of a bull and sprinkling that blood, he took his own blood into the Holy of Holies and laid himself, if you will, upon the mercy seat. You see, in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, this sprinkling or offering of blood was called making an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. <clears throat> we too, unclean, defiled by sin, Jesus makes whole, makes pure through his sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16, it was from this mercy seat that God pronounced pardon or expressed himself as reconciling the people. That they would have peace with him. The atonement was made, the blood was sprinkled, and the reconciliation thus effected. And so it is that we see this connection between the old law 
and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That he goes into the holy of holies, not made with hands, and he sacrifices himself upon the cross. And we saw some of the ramifications last week with the, the uh, amazing that, that sometimes we might have a, we take for granted or that we really can't wrap our mind around it, that, that the veil into the Holy of Holies was torn in two, which gives us now access into where God would be found once a year on this Day of Atonement. We have access to it 24-7 by the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, although this isn't the same Greek word, it is the English word, propitiation. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus has entered into that Holy of Holies to lay down His own life. That blood sacrifice upon the mercy seat. Upon the Ark of the Covenant. To die for us. To become that sacrifice. That atonement for us. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the atonement for our sins. And so it is that Jesus' life is represented in the life of that bull, but they had to make that sacrifice over and over and over. Jesus, once and for all, went and sacrificed Himself upon the cross that we may have forgiveness of our sins that we might be atoned for by the blood of the Lamb. If you're ready to access that blood by the sacrifice of yourself to give yourself completely to the Lord, to put to yourself to death in the waters of baptism, won't you come as we stand and sing?